Hello everyone, I'm Kiran Hiremat. I work as a staff software engineer at Intune. I work as part of the data platform team. Today, we'll be presenting Databricks at scale. We'll be covering the design and the architectural best practices. We'll also be talking about the challenges we faced while leveraging Databricks to run thousands of jobs. This presentation is divided into two parts. I will be covering the first part of the session where I will talk about the architecture and the infrastructure related challenges and the recommendations. The second part is going to be covered by my colleague Rama, who will talk about spark related issues we got with the Databricks and how to overcome them. We are Intuit, the maker of products like TurboTax, QuickBooks, Mint, Credit Karma, and MailChimp. We serve consumers, small businesses, and the self-employed. Our mission is to power prosperity around the world. And to do so, we are transforming into an AI-driven expert platform. Our data ecosystem is big and complex. We have hundreds of thousands of tables with petabytes of data containing decades of historical information siloed across various systems. The goal of our team is to make the life of a data worker simple. Superglue is a homegrown tool at Intuit that helps users build, manage, monitor data pipelines. Superglue was built to democratize data for analysts and data scientists. It minimizes the time spent on developing and debugging data pipelines and maximizes the time spent on building business insights. Superglue is under the hood is empowered by low-code, no-code framework called Simplan and QuickETL. We have given a presentation on that in this Databricks Summit. If you're interested, you can go and look into that. We also have capabilities like Presto on Spark, wherein a data analyst can run Presto queries on Spark. We have a presentation on that too in this Databricks Summit. If you're interested, you can go and look into that. So here are some of the Superglue numbers. We have more than 400 plus total users. We have more than 3,500 plus daily pipelines, which is affecting more than 10,000 plus tables on a daily basis, which is in turn empowering 1,000 plus daily business critical reports. And we have seen a growth of over 20x on year on year. Last year, we had around 160 jobs. Currently, we have around 3,500 plus jobs mainly because of the kind of capabilities we have added in Superglue. One important point we want to emphasize is with this kind of a growth in last one year, we started seeing a lot of scaling issues. And to understand why we had the scaling issues, we need to dig deeper into the previous architecture which we had, which was leveraging Databricks. So here, as you see, our a user comes in and creates a pipeline using Superglue Sets a UI. The job is then is scheduled on the scheduler which is then in turn interact with the Databricks, uh, Databricks using a infrastructure abstraction service. This infrastructure abstraction service is implemented by us in, within Intuit. The main objective of infrastructure abstraction service is to abstract the complexity of job creation, submission, termination, and pulling for job status. We leverage Databricks to run thousands of jobs, as I mentioned. Uh, we have we had only one PVC workspace uh, shared across multiple teams previously. Uh, what is the what is a Databricks workspace? A Databricks workspace is an environment through which you can access Databricks assets. It's a way through which multi-tenancy is supported by Databricks. For an account, you can have n number of multi, n number of workspaces. However, it is very important to know that each of these workspace has a limitations defined like how many number of jobs i can define in a workspace is limited uh, how many number of concurrent api calls i can make is also being defined it's very important to know these limits at a workspace level when you are planning to leverage databricks to run thousands of jobs we had various challenges when we were leveraging one workspace some of the issues we had is uh, ip limit issue so if there was no ips available uh, in the workspace so the job was not able to spin up a new node and the job was failing. We were not able to define a new job and we were getting max job definition limit. We were also getting API timeout limits. Uh, because of these all various type of issues, we started seeing job failures across teams, which was sharing the same workspace. So as a result, we had to throttle number of jobs we were uh, running uh, at, the, at the peak hour during the day. And we have to request our uh, analysts to, to run their uh, jobs at a different time, 
if, if they are not very critical. So now with these kind of challenges, we went back to capacity planning to understand why these issues are coming and uh, how we have to you know what is the capacity we are looking for for the next one to two years. So we did a forecast for next one to two years. We basically tried understanding what is the number of jobs we need for next one to two years and average number of nodes we need per job. And once we got this average number of jobs we need per job, we clearly understood that the number of jobs we need per workspace uh, is, is beyond the limits which is defined by workspace. Databricks workspace limits to the, is limits number of jobs to be 2,500, which was clearly beyond the number of jobs we needed. So we, we decided to leverage multiple workspace. It is also important to note that the subnet size is also defined based on the number of max concurrent nodes we would need for a given workspace. Databricks assigns two IP addresses per node, one for management of traffic, one for Spark application. The total number of instances for each subnet is equal to half of the number of IPs that are available in that subnet. The other point which we'll have to know, uh, remember is uh, if you are coming across Databricks uh, definition limits, you could leverage run submit API, wherein it would not define a job, but rather it would submit a job directly to the, uh, without creating a job in the workspace. So now, post capacity planning, we did the following modification to our architecture. We, uh, once one, uh, we defined a subnet sizing based on the number of nodes we needed per workspace. Second, we, re we, re we redesigned our infrastructure abstraction service to leverage multiple workspaces. We implemented in a way wherein just by a configuration change, we could point our jobs to different workspaces. And another point which you'll have to remember is use Terraform templates to create uh, workspaces. So that would minimize whenever you want to create a new workspace, that would minimize your uh, effort. And also do not share the uh, you know uh, workspaces with multiple teams. Uh, rather have it dedicated to a specific team based on the workload. So this is a comparison of before and after architecture diagram. As you see on the left side, there are many failures. On the right side, there are no, many, there are no failures. And we are sharing, uh, uh, we are uh, having multiple workspaces. And the subnet is also designed uh, accordingly. Now, we leverage Databricks APIs for most of our operations. Here, uh, we will talk about what, are, what you should do, what you should know when leveraging Databricks APIs at scale. API limits are at a workspace level. That's the first point. Uh, we have to have, uh, we had one issue where uh, we were having an issue at, at around where there were many jobs scheduled at 9 a.m. and uh, we were hitting throttling issues. So it is very important uh, to distribute your API calls, uh, uh, basically throttle your API calls. Uh, that is one. And second is uh, avoid uh, direct DBFS API requests. Uh, if you can go through S3 wherein you want to just do a write operation, you can do that. Uh, you can also put in retry mechanism. At any given point in time, uh, in a day, we have hundreds of jobs which are running in our system. And uh, uh, any network issue or network uh, uh, outage issue might, uh, you know, or might result into job failure. And with the exponential retries we are putting in our abstraction service, we are able to handle these kind of outages uh, very gracefully. Uh, and this would not laser result into job failure. The other point is we are using, uh, we are currently doing a polling. Uh, Databricks has provided a webhooks. So we are, planning to we are planning to switch to webhooks in future. With that said, now I will hand it over to my colleague Rama, who would be covering Spark related challenges. Um. Thank you, Kiran. Um, hello, everyone. I am Rama. I'm working as a senior software engineer on data platform team at Intuit. And uh, today I'll be covering some of the Spark related exceptions and things which we want to try to make our platform more scalable and reliable using Databricks. So apart from the platform issues discussed by Kiran, we noticed some of the frequent job failures as well. And one frequent exception which we got was pitch failed exceptions. Uh, in Databricks, we leverage Databricks auto scaling for scaling up and scaling down the number of instances required for our job. 
This helps in running our jobs optimally without over provisioning or under provisioning our clusters. But sometimes we noticed the executor was being terminated even before the shuffle file was copied to a respective reducer, which results in fetch file exception. So to fix this error, you can control the aggressive downscaling using the property spark.databricks.aggressive window downscale. Uh, we set this value to 600 seconds to solve all our user uh, related issues, but you can do some trial and error to set this interval based on your jobs and the cluster sizing. And the second issue which we frequently got was related to commit protocol. So commit protocol is a process how you commit or write your data to S3. By default, Databricks provides a DBIO protocol for writing all your files to S3. Uh, although it is reliable, fast, and uh, doesn't leave any intermediate state uh, in the S3, even if your job fails, but at Intuit, we have other data processing systems like um, Presto or Athena, uh, which have some interoperability issues with DBIO protocol. So we used the SQL Hadoop MapReduce commit protocol to write our data to S3. But this protocol causes some of our jobs to fail with file already exist exception. If the previous run failed with uh, any S3 reduce rate error or one of the executor got killed in the reduce phase, we, we generally see this file already exists exception. So we have to manually delete the S3 file or change the file name to fix this issue. So after fixing all these issues, uh, this is our before and after chart. Uh, initially, we noticed a lot of failures related to timeouts, IP limits, and Spark exceptions. But after uh, resolving all these errors, we were able to significantly bring down the number of errors on our platform. We used to get roughly 100 to 120 job failures every day, but now we have pretty minimal errors on our platform. Uh, so these are the uh, exceptions side, but uh, but in the future, uh, we want to try these things on a, on a Databricks platform. The first thing which we want to try was related to Databricks pools. So Databricks pools basically reduce your cluster start and auto scaling times uh, by maintaining a set of ideal and ready to use instances. So when your cluster is uh, attached to a pool, all the cluster nodes are created using the pool's ideal instances. So this internally uh, uh, reduces your cluster start and uh, uh, shutdown times. Uh, in our scenario, on an average, we require 1000 nodes every hour. And also with our capacity planning, we exactly knew how many number of nodes require at any point of the day. Uh, so this will, uh, so using pools was extremely uh, useful for our application and also Databricks doesn't charge uh, DBUs while your instances are ideal in the pool, but instance provider billing does apply. So due to this reason, you have to be cautious with pools. You, you shouldn't over provision your pool size. And the next thing which we want to try was commit protocol. So as discussed earlier, we were facing some issues like file already exist exception using Hadoop V2 protocol and also some interoperability issues while using DBIO protocol. So we want to evaluate Hadoop V3 protocol and see how it solves our existing issues. And the third one is uh, related to task orchestration. So in Databricks uh, latest APIs, they provide task orchestration. So you can orchestrate multiple tasks in a job which simplifies creation, monitoring, and management of your job. So for everything, you don't need to create a new job. Instead, you can use the same job and add a task to it. So this simplifies overall monitoring and management of your job. And the next one we want to try was related to Photon. Photon is the next generation engine on the Databricks Lakehouse platform. It provides extremely fast query performance at low cost. Photon is also optimized for all your data use cases and loads. In case if the, your query is not compatible with Photon, it will fall back to run on Spark. And uh, Photon also doesn't require any code changes. So to summarize, uh, these are our learnings which we encountered while running 4,000 to 5,000 pipelines on Databricks. 
So we kind of talked about how to design your architecture in such a way to scale from single workspace to multiple workspace and what all the limits such as API and IP limits you should know to avoid any platform errors and also how to handle uh, frequent spark exceptions you get on the Databricks platform. Uh, also using Terraform template is extremely helpful to automate your workspace creation. In case if you require any new A2 workspace, you can instantly create the new one using the Terraform template. So these design considerations probably should help you in running thousands of jobs on Databricks platform without any issues. Uh, thank you. Uh, please uh, feel free to reach out on our Twitter handle if you have any questions.